great to be in the house of the Lord? Yeah. Isn't it great to come and praise him today? Yeah. Has he blessed you today? Yeah. Uh, certainly he has. That's what God's about. He continues to bless you and bless you. I was just thinking uh, recently I was driving home. I, I take our students on a night drive. And I was driving home. It was about 1230. It's, it's really quiet out here. And, and I was thinking about some things to come, you know, and, and I said, Lord, you blessed me, you know, and, and, uh, and he said, Tim, I'll never stop. Yeah. I'm going to keep blessing you. I bless my kids. I keep, I don't just bless them one time. I bless them another time and another time and another time. You know, the, the one thing about being God's child is that as God's child, he's going to take care of you. And one thing, just like your own children, you like your children to be obedient, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. The Bible talks about if you be willing and obedient, eat the good of the land. You know, God does want us to be obedient because he wants to bless us the best. And a lot of times we just need to hear what God has to say. Yeah. That makes so much difference. That's the thing I just see this year. My sister uh, called me up and, and we was talking about the relationship with God. And he says, you know what, Tim? It's about prayer. It's about seeking him. And it's also about being about God's people. You know, she, she was a little struggling about going to church. I said, you know what? Sometimes you get got to get up, show up. <laughs> just get up. You know, wake up. Show up. Yeah. Just show up. Yeah. Even And I found the days that when you feel like, you know, oh, man, I just don't feel like going to church. You know, it's just a, it's a lot of effort to get up. That's the very day you should be in church. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can miss out on a blessing but not going to church. And if you can't get to church, but some, have church in your house. Because Jesus said, well, two or three, touch not green, you'd be in the midst. Mm -hmm. So he's right there with you. Yeah. My sister, well, we prayed over the phone, and, and I said, you know, it's church right now. We're praying. It's not having that to do with the phone lines. We're praying. And you know what? I said, when you pray, you need to believe what you're praying for. Mm -hmm. I thought what Pastor was talking about uh, Wednesday was absolutely true. Your thought life makes a difference. Yes, what you think about, what you dwell on. So many times, you know, David said, I hid the word in my heart. I might not sin against you. Yeah. So when you get that word inside, you don't want to do certain things. Yeah. And old say used to say about when in life changed, he said, my want to change. That's what happened. When I got saved, my want to change, my desire changed. You want to do something completely different now because you want to listen to God. Yeah. And I, I just want to share this, this passage here. It's in Exodus uh, chapter uh, 3 because I just, I just love Moses because Moses really had trimester life, you know, he had uh, the, the, the first life in Egypt, and then we, we know the story that he had to run, because he, he, you know, he, the, the, the killing in, in, in Egypt, and then he ran, and, and just think, 40 years away, you know, from all the papar paparazzi we say today, and everybody looking at him, he's growing, and you know, I'm sure, man, that, that first year, you know, he got to thinking, God, man, what's going on, you know, it seemed like I'm not here in front of you anymore. Then a decade went by. Man, he really got to think, man, God, what happened? God, you, you know, have you forgotten me back here? I'm, I'm raising these sheep back here. Do you know where I'm at? Next year, next time, another 10 decades, 20 years, 30 years. But oh, that 40th year, something happened. I want to share. This is where it starts. Now, Moses kept the flock of Jephthah's father-in-law, the priest of Midian, led the flock to the back of the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb. Or sign of the mountain of God, <clears throat> the angel of the Lord, I love that, appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush, and he looked, and behold, but the bush was burned with fire, yet was not consumed. Something drew his attention. And God always trying to get our attention. He's always, sometimes, sometimes it's just a little thing that, that God would say, Tim, don't you understand, I'm trying to bless you here. Don't you understand that you need to go pray for that person. We, I went down the bank the other day, and this lady was in there. You know how uh, after you do your business, they put you kind of in the corner and the wait for a banker to come. Well, I was sitting there, and, and I, I was talking to Leo on the phone, just waiting to tell her I'd be home. And, you know, I always tell her I love her. And the lady said, that's nice. Well, that started a conversation now. Mm -hmm. You know, so, well, that's nice to say that. I said, well, your words ought to mean something. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, 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 I'm sure I probably said this before, but I, I think it hit home like if, if you're in your life from the time you was a baby and say you lived 70 years, God only gave you one billion words in that entire time. Now, and after the billionth word, you couldn't speak anymore. Wouldn't you want to make all those words count yeah. in there? Why would you want to say ugly things to a person? 
You, you never know if that's their last day. You never know. You know, the best thing is to tell somebody to encourage them. Tell them you love them. Tell them about God. Tell them what God has done for you so they can remember. They can remember that because you know what? We, we got those watershed moments in our life where God has gun, done gay things. And I tell the kids, don't forget this day what God has done for you. When he blesses you, don't forget it. Yeah. Right. You know, sometimes that's what happens. God blesses us and then we're all happy and enthusiastic. Then things kind of taper off and then we get away from, and wonder, oh, man, God, where are you at? Where do you think I'm at? I'm in the same place I was when I blessed you. I'm still God then. Yeah. See, we, we tend to think, you know, I, I, I said this. Uh, I worked with a guy, he said, he said, Tim, I understand how you feel about God, but I only go to God in the big things. <laughs> he always said it, big things. So what's the big, you know, if I need a money or need something, this, I said, why do you do that? Why, why, why wouldn't you have a constant relationship with God so you don't have to reintroduce yourself when it comes time to pray? God, you know who I am? Remember me? It's been a while. You know, Hollywood does that a lot, a lot of time, you know. They only pray if they're in trouble. You know, they, they, they kind of remember God a little bit, and then they pray their trouble. So I don't want that kind of relationship. I want a constant relationship with God. So, man, when it comes time, we already hooked up. And he knows how I feel. He knows my heart. Exactly. You know, he knows who I am. And I, I love what this said. And in verse 3, and Moses said, I will now turn aside. So that's the difference. Sometimes we got to turn aside and see what's going on and see this great sight while the bush is not burned. And I love this. God hadn't forgotten Moses. He's working on some things, you know. We can't do it that way. You try to do it on your own strength, Moses. Deliver the edge. It ain't going to work. You got to do it my strength. You got to do it my way. Yeah. And when the Lord saw that he had turned aside, he went, is Moses going to look at this? He turned aside and see, and God called to him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. Yeah. So there's no, you know, there might have been somebody else named Moses somewhere. Named, but we know who he's calling. He called his name twice. Right? There's no, there's no misunderstanding. When your mom calls your name twice or she used all your names, you know, I guarantee you knew who she was talking about. Right? There's no distinction. They might forget it for a while. Mom always used to crack me up because she couldn't had so many kids she couldn't remember them all. You know, finally cut cut tip, chop, tip, get, go, go around. You know, you, you, you know, there. She finally, she finally got it right at the end. But you know what God did? God don't make that mistake. He said, Moses, Moses. And I love Moses' response. You know? I mean, Moses got it. I mean, hear this voice, you know, and you see burning bush. You don't really see a figure, you know, when we, when we think about that. And you know what he said? He said, here am I. That's what he said. Here am I. And I love what God responds to him. This is awesome. God said, do not come near me. Put your shoes off your feet for the place in which you stand is holy ground. Man, that's powerful. You know, anywhere God is, is holy. Because he's a holy God. And that's God, God's right here. So this is a holy place. Oh, I, I tell you, saints, one of the things I, I, I love most about God is how that he walks before you. He says, come follow me. Well, if, he, if you follow him, he's walking in front of you. That's how follow and work. Somebody got to be leading. And the thing about it, God's leading you. Uh, we, we had to do a business transaction Saturday. And we walked in there and it was like, you know God's got you in the right place. The way all the circumstances, you know it was God. And the one thing about it is that we walked in and, and, and we are perfectly uh, relaxed in it. The people was relaxed around us. If this don't work, hey, we go home and pray about it. It's all right. You know, we have to be desperate about things. You know why? Because I serve the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He can take care of this situation. Nothing is too big for God. Right. Nothing's impossible with God. Right. You know, people say, oh, Tim, I don't know which way to go, which way to go. I said, let me tell you, I know what the right way to go. Because Jesus said, I am the way. Yes. That's what he said. That's how it's going to think about it. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. That's what we need to just follow Jesus' example. One thing I love about Jesus was his compassion and understanding. You know, with the, when we was talking, y'all was talking about the, the one with the issue of blood. To me, that is such a that's such a tender story. I mean, it's just it's just you know she she spent all of her money. The doctors couldn't help her, but she she got it reminded she could just touch the hem of his garment. That's a big crowd. 
I've been, you know, we've probably been to Iowa football games or basketball games. I, I'm raised in Missouri. I went to Missouri Tiger football games. And, I mean, at one time we had 60,000 people. So the people are kind of bumping up against them. And they had a big crowd. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, who touched them? You know? Well, the disciples said, what are you talking about? <laughs> who touched me? There's people all around you. Yeah. No, no, no. You, you don't understand. Somebody touched me because power went out of me. Yeah. Something happened. It was different. It wasn't just somebody bumping. Somebody was reaching out to me. Yeah. That was the difference at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Turn around. Do. My daughter. And, you know, he just treats you so kind. You know, you, you touch me. You touch me. And she's trembling. And she told him all what happened. And she was made whole. Mm -hmm. Now, you think about that lady. When she was made whole, you know what she probably did? Boy, she was a fireball testimony. Yeah. You know that she went back, told, I'm healed. Went back to the doctor. Let me tell you, sorry you couldn't do it, but my Jesus did. Yeah. He, Jesus healed me. You know, Jesus said, I tell you, he made all the difference right there. And I knew if I could just touch him. And he turned around that day. He acknowledged me. The creator of the universe acknowledged me. Oh, is that powerful? Is that powerful? And the same with you. He acknowledges you. I love that. You know, one, one time, I, and I'll move on to uh, letting everybody else say. <laughs> I'm sorry, Pastor. But, but one time, I went down to Riverwoods. My grandkids was down there. So I, I'd go pick them up on Wednesday so they go to church. Well, there was there was two young young kids. They was, you know, it was grade school. But uh, one of them uh, had, like, cerebral palsy or something. So, and, and then the dad came in to pick them up. And the one son, he would just like a regular kid. But the, the older one, he, he was a tall kid, and, and he had these things going on. But the father touched my heart. And I'm sorry, I just get him. It just touched my heart. He said, I'm here to pick up both my sons. Mm -hmm. I'm here to pick them up. Because some people kind of, if they have a kid that's not, where they kind of push that kid off, they look at this one over here and gravitate to them. But he said, it just touched my heart. And the, young, the kid that's all, he just jumped on his dad's back and he said, we went bowling today. I love it. And it's just, you can see so much love. There was no difference between this boy and that boy. He loved them. They're my kids. And that's the way God is. They're my kids. I love my kids. I love them all. Right. And I got a plan for every one of them. Right. You, they're just not born for no reason. You are here for a reason. Right. Hallelujah. Yeah. Oh, I want to praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 God is good. Okay, I'm going to open up testimony time before I use it all up. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, I'd like to... Uh... Well, it's kind of a prayer and testimony. I've been uh, on CPAP or whatever. I sleep with it. I have uh, oxygen uh, concentrator, which they took out. It's a long story. But anyways, um, I've been having shortness of breath. And a friend of mine who's also on oxygen, uh, I went over his house and I, he had hooked up and I hooked up and I, I started feeling better and everything and I went I, I had some phlegm I kept coughing up this phlegm and I've been you know trying to get them approved get Medicare to approve so I can get back my concentrator and they said well you're, you don't qualify anyways I was over at my friend's house and when I started doing the oxygen on really small leaders I started feeling much better. And then that phlegm came up, and when it came up, it was like a reddish color. So I was coughing up some blood, and I thought about Pastor's message. When, you know, what are we going to do when such and such happens? Mm -hmm. You know, and I just said, said to my friend, well, I don't know, do I go to the ER? What do I do? I wouldn't, you know, I said, this, this is not right. So then I got on uh, WebMD and on Google and started looking up all symptoms and everything and finally the Lord said to me you know what, probably because you didn't use it at night your your oxygen you dried out a little bit so you're coughing up a little bit of blood rest in me just rest in me yeah. you said Proverbs 3, 5, 6 trust in the Lord with all your heart, with all your own understanding, acknowledge him and he will direct my path. 
And so I said, you know, Lord, I'm just, I'm just going to trust you. Awesome. I got home last night and I coughed up some more phlegm and it was clear. Hallelujah. And so I <laughs> just, you know, the prayer part is, is like I'm going to give him a call tomorrow, the doctor will call tomorrow, and just have verify and check up that I'm okay. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's good. He's a healer. Yes. God's able, you know, he's the healer, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and, and we just believe that, we just believe that he can go, he, you know, that, that's one thing I love about, about the Lord, you know, Th those are precious concerns to him, you know, and, and he's able, I mean, we look at all the doctors, God uses doctors too, he works through them, you know, and help diagnose uh, those situations, get the right medication, you know, God is good, and that's who we're going to trust, hallelujah, someone else. Uh, let's just, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, keep uh, remembering Mark and Cindy, they're not here because they're okay. in the camp in Serbia for that to be a godly time and yes. a time of restoration and, and for the Lord to speak to them and, and all good things to happen. Also, pray for my friend Jim Henry uh, for revelation of the Holy Spirit that all of those religious demands he's putting on himself are gone. He needs to do for things to get better, to trust God, and for his uh, marriage also to be lifted up, and also continue prayer for Ariana, also for revelation of the Spirit. Yes, mm -hmm. certainly will. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.
out to you. And we had, I mean, a prayer meeting really inside our house. It's the one who has the grandson that's doing drugs and whatever. And he's doing wonderful. He's going to be home in October. Amen. Um, Amen. I mean, we just prayed and thanked the Lord, did some counseling with her, and just really prayed. You know, her husband has been, they've been married 36 years. She, can, she says, I can tell you, not one day has he not touched at least a six-pack, if not a 12-pack, and he's going to stop drinking. And so we talked about all of that and just pray that, you know, he'll really be able to do this, to be an influence on this grandson that's coming back into your home. And... Um, just thank the Lord, just, you know, that he opens opportunities. The next day I got a call, and I wasn't supposed to clean this house till tomorrow. And she says, can you come over? And uh, so this is the guy who, um, they've put him in hospice now. He's 67 years old. His 92-year-old mother's taking care of him. And all he talks about is food. So I took him a fish dinner. Um, that's all he wanted. He wants some fat fish. <laughs> So I, I took him the works <laughs> with everything he wanted, the cucumbers with tomatoes and, and onions and his watermelon and everything he tells me that, you know, all he thinks about is food when you're sitting in your deathbed, basically, that's what they tell him. But, you know, that just opened up the door of opportunity. You know, I just started telling him about the love of God and how much Hallelujah. Jesus loves him. I talked to him about Pastor Nathan getting healed of hepatitis and yeah. Dane being healed. And I said, you know what? So what? You're in hospice. That's what the doctors say. But what does the Lord say? Amen. You know, we're going to stand on the faith of the Lord. And I hear that you have something you want to do. You have a little granddaughter here that you want to walk down the aisle. She's 13. I said, I got one more story to tell you. And that's the story of my mother who should have died when I was 10 years old. She lived another 17 years because she says, I will live and I will not die. I will see my son preach. I will see my kids. I will see my grandkids. Yeah. She got to see all except my fifth child, which I was pregnant. And our, all of her grandchildren except my last child, who uh, I was pregnant with, you know. And he, he, he I just kind of, you know, just kept declaring. I said, we're going to declare. We're going to proclaim. We're not going to complain. We're going to proclaim. Yeah. Gonna, Hallelujah. You know, Hallelujah. That's what we're going to do. I said, I'm going to bring you some scriptures, and you're going to start saying, I'm healed. I'm going to walk down. I don't care that I'm in hospice. Who oh, cares? You're right. eating that's this right. fish. I said, my mom couldn't even do that, Bill. My mom, literally, my dad had to spoon feed her, and Jesus' name swallowed this, and Jesus' mm -hmm. name swallowed it. She couldn't even pick her spoon up. You're not any worse than my mother was that the Lord revived. And, I mean, we had a time. His mom came in there, and we prayed. And, and the presence of the Lord, like you said, we don't have to be in a church service, was there. But I promised him, he says, man, do you go to the same church my mom goes to? I said, no, I just go to a little church on the east side, but we believe in the healing power of Jesus. And I'm telling you, you don't have to die. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, right. his name is Bill, and I promised him that we'd pray for him to live because he wants to live. He wants to yeah. have a life. He said, yeah. there's so many things I want to do, and here I am bedridden, can't do nothing on oxygen 24-7, you know. That doesn't have to be. doesn't have to be. We, we can Come declare on. it. And he can believe it, and, and, you know, if it's his time, it will be his time. Right. But, but whatever the Lord wants, I just, you know, just, to me, that's not work. <laughs> you know, when you go and for an hour, you're just, you're just talking about the Lord and praying with people. Uh, I, I just, and Evelyn also, uh, her daughter's about to be married, and, and uh, the guy's older, as her children are, uh, but... Um, her soon-to-be son-in-law was in the hospital for some heart issues going on, and so she asked that we pray for him. So I promised her that we would do that, too. Amen. Very good. All right. Amen. Uh, last week, I asked you to pray for the friend of mine, Erica. Uh, trying to get her to come to church. I think she's almost ready to. But, uh, she's in a downward spiral. Last night I talked to her and she said, well, they're going to split up. They do together since 16, they're 25 now, 18, she's nine. Um, she said, it seemed to be in too much home to church with me last night. Yeah. Yeah. I said, well, what do you want us to pray for? And she said, just that God's will be done. Amen. She's talking about going baptized in tongues. Okay. We'll definitely keep her in prayer. Yeah. God is able. There's a, becoming quite a separation that's becoming more and more obvious of the sheep and the goats. Yes. God is bringing us more and more in contact with the sheep. We're, we're running into people, and I was reminded, I forgot all about it, but we had elk hunting out in Colorado, and we were in the hunting camp. And, you know, I don't shove what I believe, right. but I, I keep it. 
That's right. That's right. And uh, the last day that we were there, I was in the kitchen area having coffee, and my son and grandson had they were they already had everything loaded to head back. And I don't know why the the, the lady there, the cook, and her husband, he was cooking some eggs or something. And I just. If you go to Sunday school and you hear those stories, they are just as relevant for today. And I told him about, well, then the, the guy that was cooking, he said, well, I've been diagnosed with colon cancer. Mm. And I said, well, then maybe you're the reason that whole story. But I said, I want to tell you, though, I, I want to assure you, he is exactly the same. And then it came up what you were saying about the woman that touched the hem of his garment. So he talked about that. And then I said, remember, when he went to Nazareth and they just said he could do, he just didn't right. do it. Right. Because of unbelief. And I said, for years, I thought that unbelief hampered God. And I said, oh, Father Sanchez, well, he could care less if you believe or not. doesn't alter him at all. But the, the defining factor was that because of her unbelief, they made no demands on she touched him and virtue went out. She made a demand. Yes. Her, she wanted something. That's right. And that's uh, when he felt go out. When we go to God, that's the way we have to go. We have to go wanting an answer more than anything because Hallelujah. you put a demand on God, he will not let you down. Right. Hallelujah. But if you just tiptoe, you know, I, I think so, and I've done this a hundred times, Lord, if it's your will. Yes. It's always his Hallelujah. That's the wrong way to think. Thank you, Jesus, for this Thank is you. what I'm asking. That's right. I know that your will is to fulfill that. Yes. And we are seeing all over people that are just hungry. You don't have to throw anything at them. You just got to be ready when the door opens to, to tell them. Yeah. Right. And I just think that, again, we were talking about Moses. In that day, expect a burning bush any day. I get up every day and tell James, you know, I turn the news on because I expect to hear it. Those people may not know what's going on, but when we hear it, we'll know it. Yeah. That's right. We'll know it. That's right. Anyhow, Hallelujah. He's a great God. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. definitely pray. We'll definitely pray. Yep. Yep. We're going to bleed. We're going to bleed together. Hallelujah. That's great. That's great. That's great. That's right. That's right. That's right. A new creature in Christ. Yep.
That's right. Yes. That's right. That's awesome. Yes, we'll definitely pray. That, that I have never, you know, when you t when you ask people, they ask, say, you're going to pray for them. You know, they are. That look kind of comes in. You're going to take time out of your life and pray for me. You know, and, and when you pray for them and they get the answer, hey, sometimes they'll come back, man, everything went right. You know, I went to the doctor and they didn't have to end up, didn't even do surgery. Something changed because God came in and intervened. And that's what you want to look like. And just believe. Just Amen. believe. Amen. And, and also, speaking of surgery, I got a, a friend at work that he's going to have surgery on uh, 22nd. And then next weekend, Lee and I will be gone. We uh, pull a Valley Band trailer. Uh, they're going to be uh, west part of Chicago. So, uh, so it's going to be, you know, Saturday and Sunday. But I just always pray over that because when you pull a 70-foot rig inside, the, we're going to go in the northern uh, Illinois University football stadium area so you know to always think just get me in and out of there and yeah. you know sometimes there's 10,000 people or 20,000 you got to get that trailer in and out of there and I don't take that for granted I just pray that you know they always which I've been so thankful they always remember we got the longest unit in the whole district and they always keep me in spot so I can get in and out of it they always do that you know and I just so thankful for that yeah. yes all right anyone else not we'll stand and have prayer, please. Hallelujah. Let's lift the Lord up. Jesus, we thank you today because you are a mighty God. That Lord, hallelujah, the needs we have with, with, with the, the ones that have been brought up to you. Hallelujah. Diabetes issues, heart issues, uh, uh, issues uh, that Lord that was represented today. Father God, that you are able. You are the God that healeth. You are the God that can change a life. You are God above all gods. Hallelujah, you are a healer. You are a deliverer. You are the Prince of Peace. You are the wonderful God. And we're just going to believe that these needs are going to be met, but you're going to watch over. Hallelujah. Thank you for bringing Sheila's purse, uh, back wallet back home. I guess because it, it may never come back home. But because, Lord, you touched that individual to call, hallelujah, and bring it back. We thank you for working in Myron's life. We thank you for working in our people's lives, Lord. Those that have been addicted and now they're clean. It's all because of you, God. It's all because of you. Because, God, you are bigger than any problem. You are bigger than any concern. Oh, hallelujah. <clears throat> Let us never forget. Let us never forget what you have done. How you work miracles in my life, my family's life. Because, God... Hallelujah, you are the miracle worker. Lord, you can do what can't be done. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Because it's all about you. In the beginning, God. Hallelujah. That's what it's all about. In the beginning, before we was formed in a mom belly, you knew us. You was knitting our personality together. And you have a plan. We wasn't just born on this earth for no reason. Lord, I thank you for those divine interventions that you bring people together. Hallelujah. That you can bring, because that word, that word that goes out should not return void. Yes. It's going to accomplish whatever you sent it to do. Yes. And we need to be about speaking your word. There's so many people hungry. They're hungry for a change in their life. They hunger for something different. Lord, they, and, and some are still wrapped in darkness. Lord, we are the light. You called us to be the light and the salt of this world. Let us be that. Let us, as Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed. And Paul declared, one thing I want to do, hallelujah, I'm going to forget those things. I'm going to forget those things behind me. I'm going to reach for My past is done. My past is gone. My past is gone. Hallelujah. That you cast all my sin. Hallelujah. 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 You cast all of our sins in the sea of forgetfulness. Hallelujah. To never bring them up again. That's the kind of God. You're a loving, merciful God. Long suffering. Hallelujah. Full of mercy and truth. The mercies are new every day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We got so much to be thankful for. Thank you for our food, our clothing, housing, our jobs. Hallelujah. Thank you for the income that comes in. Thank you for those unexpected blessings. Hallelujah. You give us more than enough. Because we serve a God that's more than enough. Hallelujah. Bigger than anything. Bigger than any problem we might have. A God that deals in impossibilities. Oh, it's impossible, Tim. We got a God that's the realm he deals in. Impossibilities. With God. For with God. For with God all things are possible. Hallelujah. We want to praise you today. We want to give you the love, Lord, the love, the praise, and the glory. Hallelujah. In their wonderful, wonderful name, and we pray amen and amen. amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, we're going to speak the word. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons. I speak in new tongues. I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Hallelujah. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every deed, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. Hallelujah. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. And Abraham's blessings are mine. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is good. Yes. You may be seated. Toby and Juan come up. The offering, please. Thank you, guys.
you, Brother Tim, for that word. It was powerful. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but there's some changes up here on the platform. I'm standing up today, <laughs> which is not usual. Now I can actually see Pastor and feeling the signal. Come up. <laughs> but, yeah, I think it's down. Uh, anyway, yesterday when I was here, uh, you know, getting everything set up, I was praying and I, wanna, I was asking the Lord to give me direction. And as I was uh, meditating, he spoke to me and he said, are you leading tomorrow? And I said, yes, I am. And he says, then why are you sitting now? <laughs> Leaders don't sit. They stand up. So I was making excuses for myself. No, I don't play standing up because I, I cannot pick the guitar. I need to have a hold on it. Whatever. That's just an excuse. <laughs> so from now on, you're going to see me standing up. Weird. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Uh, I want to read you a scripture uh, for when I was putting this set together. Uh, it's Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each, of each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We are filled with that same Spirit. Amen. This, is called, this song is called Sweet Wind. Amen. Mm -hmm. 
16 to 19. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all full, the fullness of God. Jesus, like Don said, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So you shouldn't be afraid of anything. That's right. song is called One Thing Remains.
Let's lift our hands to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you for your endless love. Thank you, Lord, that you never leave us or forsake us. Thank you, Lord, that your love isn't based on our goodness, but on your goodness. Thank you, Lord, that you see us as the righteousness of you in Christ. Thank you, Lord, for tearing down the barrier that has separated us from you and given us free access to your grace, to your mercy, to your love. We thank you for it this morning, Lord. We give you praise. You alone are worthy. We thank you for the healings and the miracles that have already taken place based on your finished work, Lord. We just accept it, receive it by faith in the mighty and the matchless name of Jesus. And everybody said, praise the Lord. Praise Lord. Give him a hand clap. Praise God. Thank the Lord. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Roberto. And thank you, worship team. Praise the Lord. Thanks all of you for being here this morning. Praise the Lord. It's a good day in the kingdom. Hawkeyes won. Praise the Lord. <laughs> it's only a game. Uh, tell that to the Hawkeyes. Praise the Lord. And for those uh, Cyclone fans, our sympathy. Praise the Lord. And I mean that. Praise God. As long as they're not playing the Hawkeyes, I'm all for them. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. Is that a rebuttal coming from James? Okay. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay, thank the Lord. If you have a Bible or you just want to look up here on the screen, let's start with Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 21. And again, Sheila, got a lot of scriptures here, so get ready. Praise the Lord. Just to begin with, at least, Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 21. And I, Tim was saying, and of course, uh, it's been repeated this morning, but that Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Of course, you can say the same thing of God because Christ is God in the flesh. But we're saying that G God doesn't change. Now, I know a lot of times when people read the Old Testament, they think you're looking at two different gods. You have God the Father in the Old Testament, and he's out killing people and you know, really screwing people's lives up and punishing them and cursing them and all sorts of things like that. And then you have Jesus show up in the New Testament and he's just going about blessing and healing and delivering. So it's understandable that people can get a, uh, you know, kind of a mixed up idea of God. But the God of the Old Testament was just as much a God of love and a God of grace as the God who manifests himself in flesh, same God, in the New Testament. They're not, he isn't schizophrenic. It isn't like he has one thing going on in the Old Testament and something else going on in the New Testament. We know we have two different covenants, but prior to that, the law being given, the people that God dealt with were totally under grace. Abraham's a perfect example. He is the father of faith because once you came to the law, it didn't take any faith anymore. It just took hard work, perseverance, and a lot of sacrifices. But God had improv or uh, Im imparted to them, along with the law, a means by which they could escape the punishment of the law by giving them sacrificial rites. So they could offer up sacrifices, and uh, on the Day of Atonement once a year, there was sacrifice given for the whole, all the people of Israel. And uh, unless the high priest really messed up big time, it would be accepted by God, and the people's sins would be covered for another year. So the grace is still there. The, the issue, though, is that God is a righteous, a holy, and a perfect God. Therefore, he demands perfection from his creation. Well, knowing that we couldn't be perfect, he gives us a sacrifice so that we can still have connection to him, so that we still have access to him. Well, Jesus was the fulfillment of all of those laws. He, in other words, he kept all of the demands of God in order for us to be acceptable to God again, in order for us to be sinless in the eyes of God. Sin can't enter in where God is, so if God says, I'll never leave you or forsake you, that says a whole lot about what he's done about sin. Amen? The issue of sin is already a settled deal. I mean, it's already been dealt with. The only thing that is left is for us to accept it or to receive it by faith in Christ. 
Amen? So I want to show you, and I, I'm going I'm to give you some extremes here, because a lot of times we talk about grace, and I'm all for grace, for me. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But there are some people out there that, you know, if it was up to me, I might just not be as graceful as God. But I want to show you how God, the reality of God, the, 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 the extreme radicalness of God. We see Jesus as a radical because he comes in into an established religious uh, environment and just turns everything upside down. Not because he was against religion per se, but because he was against the perversion of, of that religion and how it represented God. He came as the exact perfect representation of God. There's no difference between Jesus and God. If there were, then he lied, and he was just a faker. He said, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. What I do, it's the Father that does it through me. Jesus was a man. He operated now, I know he was God in the flesh, but he operated solely as a man, just like you and I. He operated by the power of God within him, but he never operated as God. He never took the authority. He said he became a man of like passions, of similar uh, you know, situations and circumstances. It was said before, he had to grow up. He grew in stature and in knowledge and wisdom when it came to God. So he wasn't born... Uh, with total understanding of everything that was going on. He wasn't, uh, you know, pristine. And I mean, he, he uh, let's just, you know, be gross here for a moment. But he messed up his diaper, his swaddling clothes. He had to be changed. He, he got sick, he, you know, as a child, I'm sure. Uh, he was, wasn't, uh, you know, any different than any other little baby. But as he grew, he grew in his knowledge and understanding of God to the point where when he was baptized at, at, uh, in the Jordan, uh, immediately God acknowledges this and says that this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He identifies him. The Holy Spirit comes down in the form of a dove uh, representing the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus goes and immediately he's taken out into the desert and attacked by the devil. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, if you're going through some stuff, doesn't mean you're not a child of God. Doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. Doesn't, it just means, hey, this is a world that is full of curses. It's filled with tribulations. But be of good cheer, because he has overcome the world. Doesn't mean that everything in the world is perfect. It just means we have a way of, of living through things and, and uh, you know, uh, not being affected in the same way that unbelievers are. So I want to I want to I just want to stretch you a little bit this morning and see what God really wants to do. I mean, I know my life. I know uh, geez, I'm far from perfect. Uh, amen. I know I heard I just heard that. Praise the Lord over here. Uh, and I have to tell the truth because she's here and she'll rat me out if I don't, but so it's not just because I'm such a wonderful honest person. It's just a you know, there's no point in lying if somebody's going to expose you, praise the Lord. So, I mean, I'm just saying, we're all, we all are human beings. We all fail. We all make mistakes. We all make poor choices sometimes and do things. But it doesn't alter God's feelings towards us. But it goes way beyond that. It isn't just the fact that, you know, you've been married and divorced, or you, or you get drunk, or you get high, or you, uh, you know, curse somebody out, or punch somebody out, or who, whatever it might be, any number of things. And, just, and, and even if you did all of that, you'd still be thinking. And Jesus said, if you think about it, you might as well do it because you're already guilty of it. I mean, as far as the law is concerned, right? So let's talk about grace, but let's talk about it the way that Jesus talked about it and the way Paul taught it, amen? The way God presents it the reality of it, and it should make us more gracious. And that's what this world needs. It needs to know that God loves them. He may not love what they're doing, but it doesn't change his love for them. Praise the Lord. And they need to know that.
They need to know that this God isn't asking them to check off your list of what needs to be done before he'll accept you. He's already accepted you. He died for you 2,000 years ago. Amen? When you were not even here, but knowing his foreknowledge that even though you wouldn't want him, that you would reject him, that you would say, I don't believe that stuff. I don't want to be involved in that. He still did it. And he still did it for you. So while we were enemies of Christ, or while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to get our act together and now I'll be your sacrifice. He knew full well there would be a lot of people that would never receive him, that would never accept him, and yet he died for those same people. Whether they would ever accept him or not was irrelevant as far as he was concerned. He was going to take care of the sin of the world. Then it would just be left up to the world to decide who would receive Amen, that sacrifice for their sins. So they don't ever have to be judged. Amen, never have to be condemned. Never have to suffer punishment for anything we've ever done or ever will do. Somebody ought to say praise the Lord because, I mean, that just wiped out every negative in our life. Doesn't mean there won't still be negative stuff happening, but I'm saying as far as we are concerned individually, there is no negative. The worst thing that can happen, on the one hand, is that you would die. But on the other hand, it's the best thing that can happen because that's what we're all moving towards at some point anyway. I mean, unless the Lord comes before, we're going to die. That may come as a shock to some of you, but believe me, it will happen. It's appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. Good news for us, even though there may be death, the judgment's already been dealt with. He was judged. Praise the Lord. All right, so let's look at some of these scriptures. This is Old Testament, and these are the people of God, his chosen people now. Amen? Whom he would eventually be born through, their lineage. Amen? So how has the faithful city become a harlot? It was full of judgment, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. He's talking about Jerusalem. He's talking about Israel. Amen? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't give you another scripture, did I? Uh, Isaiah 43, verse 24. Thou hast bought me no sweet cane with money, neither hast thou filled me with the fat of thy sacrifices, but thou hast made me to serve with thy sins. Thou hast wearied me with thine iniquities. Isaiah 57 and 3. But not, draw near hither, ye sons of the sorceress, which is spooks, goblins, all that kind of stuff. The seed of the adulterer and the whore. <laughs> this is your loving father. <laughs> sons of sorceresses, seeds of adulterers, and the whore. <coughs> Praise God. <coughs> Isaiah 57, 5. Inflaming yourselves with idols under every green tree, slaying the children. We think abortion is something we developed. They were killing their children. Israelites, Jews, children of God, were murdering their own children, offering them as sacrifices to Baal and to other gods, little g, other idols. This was happening to the people of God. Slaying the children in the valleys under the cliffs of the rocks. Isaiah 59, verse 7. And this is just a handful. I mean, you can go all the way through and find plenty of this kind of stuff. Amen. 59.7, their feet run to evil. They make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. Isaiah 64 and verse 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Praise the Lord. Isaiah 49, verses 14 through 16. See, we could find us right here in any of these. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But Zion said, the Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. So Israel is, this is what Israel is saying. God's forsaken me. The Lord's forgotten me. 
And here's God's response. Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. So God says, with all of this stuff, I haven't forgotten you. I haven't forsaken you. I haven't left you. In fact, I've tattooed your names in my hands. Now, I know all kinds of tattoos people get today. What their motives are, I don't know. I don't care. I mean, it doesn't bother me. Uh, I've got a couple of tattoos. And, uh, but when I was a young guy, uh, when I was getting these tattoos, I was 19, a tattoo was a, was a sign of a commitment. In other words, I've got one here that says mom. <laughs> yeah, mom. That's what I'm talking about. Mom. Why? Because my mother was committed to me. It wasn't that I was a mama's boy. It was that I was still her boy. And when I went through all the things that I went through in all of my life, and a lot of it was pretty ugly, and my mother stood by me. She didn't endorse what I did, but she never forsook me. She was still mom. You know, she was still there for me. And uh, so that's why. And then on an, another part of my body, I have a anchor, globe, and eagle, you know, the Marine Corps, Semper Fi, USMC. Why? Because it was a commitment that I made. It could have been a lifelong commitment. I mean, my life could have ended because of that commitment. So I was committed to that, and that's why I got the tattoos. That's what God's talking about. He's tattooed your name because he has made a commitment to you that's never going to change. It wasn't just for the sake of body art, you know. It's because he's saying something about his commitment to us to his people. Praise the Lord. Now, here's God's response to Israel. As the scripture says, as she lies drunk with lust for evil. That's the way God's seen him. All right, here's his response. Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 18. Because the devil will tell you, well, yeah, I mean, he saved Nathan because, I mean, he's a preacher. Well, believe me. (laughs) <laughs> it's got nothing to do with it. Amen? I mean, it has nothing to do with it. God saved me simply because I received what he offered me. As, as you, you want to go digging in my path? You don't have to dig. It's right there. I mean, it's there. You don't have to look really hard to find how despicable I was at times. But God still loved me. He had me tattooed in his hands. Amen? Not because of anything I was going to do or anything that I had done, but simply that's how God is. That's how he feels about all of us. Amen? And I'm going to show you he feels that way about every creature, every human being that has been created. Okay? And therefore, after all of this nasty stuff, here's what the Lord says. Therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you, For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for Him. Praise the Lord. When we expect God's judgment, God responds with grace. When everything in the natural tells us judgment should come, what actually comes from God is grace. Because grace isn't leniency. It's an act of God for His own glory, to do what no other God, little g, can do. Amen? Forgive those who don't deserve it. Forgive those who can't earn it. He delights in forgiving unforgivable people. That's the fact. The Bible says that this this grace and its its, uh, release to humanity will bring glory to God throughout eternity. His goodness, His love, His grace, His mercy, His forgiveness is what brings glory to God forever. Amen? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 28 and 29. 1 Corinthians uh, 1, 28 and 29. 
Praise the Lord. And, the, and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. See, I love this because that's me. That, 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 that gives me hope. Hallelujah. He takes the base things. I've been pretty base. Hallelujah. And, and, and things which are despised. I've been despised. Amen. Hath God chosen? Yea. And things which are not to bring to naught things that are. He can bring nobody to bring nothing in their life to something. Yes. Praise the Lord. So that I can't take any credit for it. You can't glory in it. All you can do is give glory to God. Yes. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That's why the book of Exodus is filled with sinners and outcasts who become conduits of grace when God frees his people from Egypt. Yes. Now, they weren't under the law at that time. This was just the grace of God. They cried out to God. God showed up and delivered them based on a covenant, a promise that he had made to Abraham a thousand years before this. Amen? He really didn't owe them anything. But he owed it to them simply because he had made a promise to their progenitor, to their, uh, the father of these people. Amen? So it's just too often that we've read the Old Testament and we're looking for heroes to copy instead of a gracious God to thank. We're looking to want to be David or be Moses or be somebody when really the only thing that's in there for is to bring glory to God. It's for us to see that this God is so good and He's such a gracious God because these are all flops. These are all failures. We look at them now with you know, hindsight and we say, oh man, wouldn't you like to be like Moses? A murderer? I don't think so. I mean, it would bring some problems. Amen? So, in, in, let me just say this. In 1994, Jeffrey Dahmer was serving several life sentences for murder. I don't see any of the kids up here, so I'll just lay it right out there for those of you who may not remember, who didn't have a newspaper or television or something back then, but... He was serving several life sentences for murder because he had murdered, then had sex with the body, then dismembered those bodies, and then ate part of them. How would you like to witness to Jeffrey Dahmer? Well, in an interview just in a, not, it's almost offhandedly, he says, I wish I could find inner peace. Now this is a cannibal of the worst degree, a, a, a necromaniac, a, a perverse, I mean as perverse as it gets. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I mean it's, it's just hard to even get your head around somebody being able to do any one of those things, let alone all of them. And this Christian woman by the name of Mary Mott, this is all established. It's true. She sent him several Bible studies. She heard the interview that he was looking for inner peace. Now, he's serving several. He's not getting out of jail. He's going to spend the rest of his life in jail, as he should for the crimes that he committed. But she sends him these a bunch of different Bible studies, and then he writes to her and asks for more. So she sends some more. And then she had a friend who lived in, I think this is in Oregon or Washington, I can't remember. No, Idaho. And she sends him a letter to this individual, this pastor, by the name of uh, Roy Rat Ratliff, and asks him to go and visit Jeffrey Dahmer, and share the gospel with him. Now, this guy's not real excited about doing it, but he prays about it, and he finally decides, you know, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna, i go, I'll just go do what I can do. So he did, and his story was that Dahmer accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. Now, I'm talking about Grace. And most of the people were cynical, Christians especially. 
But Roy Ratliff stood by his word and said, I'm as confident that he has received Christ as I am anybody that I've ever prayed with or presented the gospel to. Now, Dahmer, who was later murdered, murdered while he was in prison by another inmate, was saved. <laughs> oh, yeah. Praise the Lord. So just, I mean, here's what we ask ourselves. Are there, are there some crimes that are too vile, too twisted, too unspeakable to be forgiven? Is there a leash to be put on grace to restrain it? Would I save Jeffrey Dahmer? Probably not. I mean, I don't know. I'd like to think that I could, but knowing what we know, I don't know if I could even be in the same room with the guy. But grace doesn't have a leash. It's untamed. It's unbound. And it runs wild. It's everywhere for everybody. You say, well, doesn't it have to be some kind of balance, Nathan? I mean, grace and justice. Can't imagine our father running after Jeffrey Dahmer. So, you know, like the prodigal son, he runs to him. So we need to keep grace under control. When it snaps the leash and runs free, churches get nervous. Religious Christians get uptight. Romans chapter 5, verse 20 and 21. I'm not so concerned about describing how heinous and hideous and horrible acts some people commit are. What I'm talking about is where sin abounds, grace doth that much more abound. God's love is greater than any horrendous, hideous, horrible. It's not an excuse. It's not an excuse for that kind of behavior or that kind of action. But God's grace is still sufficient. You can say amen or don't say amen, but it's still the truth. Just because we would have a problem forgiving doesn't mean that God has a problem forgiving. For God so loved the world, did he not know that Jeffrey Dahmer would be in this world, and Hitler's, and Mussolini's, and I'm not saying all these people are saved, I don't know. But I know that anybody who cried out and, and, and cried out the name of the Lord and prayed for forgiveness, God would be willing to forgive them doesn't mean that there wouldn't be consequences for what they've done or what their behavior, but it does mean that God could still forgive them and would still forgive them. We need to get outside of our own little stuff that we think He was gracious to me for. And then we try to outdo each other. Well, He, he showed me more grace than He did you. Because I did more bad stuff. No, the truth is it took the same amount of grace for everybody. Jeffrey Dahmer, you know, to the, to the sweetest little old lady on the block. Amen. Now, the little old lady on the block may not believe that, but it's still the truth as far as God sees it. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody's going to hell without Jesus. Nobody is going anywhere else but hell without Jesus. Hallelujah. And, and it's not about you, it's about Him. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And that just simply means when the law showed up, all of a sudden there's rules. Before there were rules, I didn't know you were breaking a rule, right? So the law comes along to show us there are parameters. There are ways to live, right? And it also showed that we were breaking all those laws. So where sin abounded because of the law, grace did much more abound. Amen? That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah. So in some ways, the word grace has lost its meaning. It's lost its power. It's lost its beauty. Because it's like so many other words that we use in the English language, and I suspect in every other language, but we say, oh, I love that. 
I love you. I love the dog. I love spaghetti. I, I love lasagna. I love my wife. Really. You know, we just use words and they don't really have the meaning that they're supposed to have. And we can say things like grace. Most of us have been in churches where they talked about being saved by grace and then you would hear nothing but what you got to do now in order to be saved or to stay saved. It's just not, it's, it's, it's a misunderstanding of the word grace. Grace is the most powerful thing in the world. It's God's identity. It's God's reality. Amen? Divine grace is God's relentless and loving pursuit of not His friends, His enemies. Oh, somebody ought to say hallelujah, because we were all enemies. That's what He's talking about. Divine grace is God's relentless, not His, I'll take a shot at this guy, and if it doesn't work out, I'll move on. No, it's a relentless and loving pursuit pursuit of his enemies. Praise the Lord. Ephesians chapter 2, let's read verses uh, 1 through 7, Sheila. Ephesians 2, 1 through 7. I'm hoping this will make you feel better about yourself, about your future. But even more importantly, It'll make you feel different about other people. That you can see him as the worthwhile creation of God. That they have value, that they have worth, that God loves them. I don't care what they're doing. I don't care what their behavior. We can despise it, we can hate it, the law can punish them for it, but God still loves them. He's not, in, he's not endorsing their behavior, but he's loving his creation. Just like a mother. She may not love the behavior of the child, but she doesn't stop loving the child. She'll still do anything for him. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. In the ages to come, Forever, he's going to show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Jesus. Praise the Lord. People that deny grace, the, the extremity, the extreme, the, the radical grace, are denying God glory. They're denying God the one thing that he wants. And the only way that he declares he can have it. He's not, he's not wanting to be known by his great power, although he's all-powerful. He's not wanting to be known by his, uh, his uh, uh, omniscience, although he's omniscient. He knows everything. He's wanting to be known by his grace, his love, his mercy. Grace is is God's aggressive pursuit of and stubborn delight in freakishly foul people. <laughs> Say that five times. Freakishly foul people. I've known a bunch of freaks that were pretty foul. And they were people. And God so loved them. since we all stood or stand guilty in God's courtroom based on the scripture we just read. Homeschooling moms and prostitutes. Vegans and cannibals. We all desperately need the same stuff. We all need grace. I'm telling you, I, 
I feel the Holy Spirit. Why? Because this is bigger than me. It's more than just me. It's God so loves the most hideous, the most despicable that he gave. Is this hard to swallow? I'm not saying who's saved or who isn't. I'm saying that Jesus paid the price for Jeffrey Dahmer, for Adolf Hitler. Huh? For you pick a, some despicable person out of history, and Jesus died for him. Now, whether they accepted that death as atonement for their sin is another question. But if they did, they're saved. You'll see them in heaven. Uh, praise the Lord. Luke 19.10. This isn't some, grace is not some little thing. Grace is everything. And when we try to play around with it and try to add to it or take away from it, we're, we're, we're just not being scriptural. And we're denying the very thing that Jesus came to die in order to release. For everybody. Amen? For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Not those that are just a little bit lost. Not those that are just kind of you know, strayed away from the path a little bit. He came looking. You don't, have to, you don't have to go looking for somebody that just stumbled off the path a few feet. If you're on the path, you'll see him when you go by. He went out looking for these people that are nowhere near the path. He's out seeking to save that which is lost. So Jesus didn't just come and give grace to beggars that he stumbled across between towns. Jesus hunted them down and poured out his grace. He went looking for them to give them grace. The same Jesus who turned over the tables in the temple overturned the social and the religious norms for dispensing grace. So it's not surprising that Jesus would be especially drawn to a cannibalistic fornicator with a sick attraction to dead people. It's just disturbing. <laughs> it ought to be. We ought to be disturbed because we still judge. Yeah. And God's not judging. Not yet anyway. God is just loving and extending grace. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 9 and 10. For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle. This is Paul speaking, because I pers persecuted the church of God. He was killing people that were Christians. That's what Paul's job was when Jesus knocked him off his horse on the way to Damascus, if you read the story. He was on his way to Damascus to arrest Christians, of whom he was persecuting to the extreme. They were being beaten, they were being stoned to death, some were being killed, and he was, in fact, we know the first martyr, Stephen, Paul's standing there holding the coats of the guys that are stoning him to death. He's saying, give him another one for me. He was a murderer. And not just a murderer of evil people, a murderer of innocents. Children, adults, believers. That's their only crime, is they believe in Jesus. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Paul was targeted. He was hunted and conquered by grace. Amen? Paul devoted his life to proclaim the message of grace, not just grace, but grace off the leash. Grace running wild. Grace for everybody. Amen? The people in Paul's day, the, the, you know, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the rabbis, the religious leaders, and so forth, they understood some of what Paul was saying. Amen? The good news about the gift of grace, but their, their way of looking at it was the gift of grace was to those who were worthy of gifts. 
right? But Paul picks it up where Jesus left off. Will we? Will we hug a harlot? Praise the Lord. Befriend a beggar. Forgive our enemy 70 times 7. See, it's not hard to confess grace with our lips and at the same time mock it with our lives. Don't look to the Old Testament for morality codes, for behavior patterns, so that you can be like Abraham, so that you can live like Jacob, or be a leader like Moses, or Joshua, or David, or fight like Samson, or stand up for God like Esther. The moral approach puts the emphasis on people instead of on God. Amen. Abraham was a liar. Jacob was a cheater. Moses was a tongue-tied murderer. Esther broke more commandments than she kept, and she never mentioned God once. Read the story. Samson was a self-centered, vengeful porn star, enslaved by lust and bloodshed. These are the patriarchs. These are the people people want to be like. How about Tamar and Judah? Judah's son dies. And his widow, whom the father is supposed to take care of, doesn't. So she goes off into town and becomes a prostitute. A few weeks later, religious dad happens to be going through town and decides... I think I'll shop in here. But he doesn't have any cash with him because he hasn't sold his sheep yet. So he leaves his staff and his ring, his identification, as a down payment and says, I'll be back to pick up my stuff, and when I do, I'll pay you for it. This is his daughter-in-law. His daughter-in-law knows him, but he doesn't know it's her. He just thinks it's another prostitute. These are the patriarchs. Greed, incest, lust. Sounds human to me, but that's who they are. That's what they were. So what's God doing? Well, if you want to follow these people, if you want to be like these people, instead of seeing God in all of this and seeing God's grace and God's mercy, and you want to emulate Tamar and Judah, or you want to emulate Moses or David, you're going to end up in jail. Really, you're going to go to jail. They are breaking laws all over the place, murdering people, stealing, killing. I mean, it's insane. And we're saying, gee, I wish I could be like David. Well, there's some things about David that I'd like to have, uh, that I could say I, I live my life that way. But the thing about David was the only thing that really made David stand out, the re- not because of any of his behavior. My God, he was horrible. His whole family was dysfunctional. You got kids killing one another. He, he's, you know, he, he, he just, he, he, he lies to God. God tells him to do something. He totally ignores it and does just the opposite. He murders a guy so that he can have sex with his wife, which he already had sex with, and now he's got to murder the guy because she ends up pregnant. Yeah. So, so that the guy won't find out, he sends him out into the front of the battle and says, now everybody else pull back. He, could, he just well put a gun to his head. He murdered him. Yeah. And that, that goes on and on and on in the life of David. But the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. Why? Because the one thing you find out about David is he learned that even though he was despicable, God still loved him. And God would have mercy on him if he would believe in God's mercy. David was ahead of his times in terms of the the way he saw God. He saw God as a God of grace. When he was asked, what are you going to do? You want to fall into the hands of your enemy? As punishment for what he had done. 
fall in the hands of your enemy, have sickness, you know, in the, in the country for X amount of days, or throw yourself on the mercy of God. He said, I'll take God. I'll trust God. God had a right to do whatever God wanted to do, but David said, I know God. I don't know what my enemies might do. I don't know what sickness and disease might do, but I do know God, and he will be merciful. So he throws himself on the mercy of God. Hallelujah. So what's God doing? How, how is God revealing himself? We talk about God speaking to us. We talk about the burning bush. I believe there's burning bushes everywhere, every day. I really do. Sometimes we're just, like Tim said, sometimes we just miss it and we don't say, here am I. God's saying, here I am, and we're not responding. <laughs> Amen. But God shows up in our lives all the time. Amen. And my life is not a religious life. And yet God shows up all the time. I mean, you know what I'm saying. I'm not cloistered in a monastery somewhere praying 12 hours a day and only listening to Christian music. I'm, I'm living a life. But God is in it. God's there. I don't have to, you know, be weird and strange in order to interact with God. It's just a natural thing for a child of God to talk to God. I talk to him the same way I'm talking to you right now. Well, there are a few times when I may get a little more desperate, but most of the time I'm just talking like I'm talking. I'm just having a conversation. So how's God going to overcome our sin? How's he going to keep his promises and reestablish the Garden of Eden, this Eden or Garden of Eden-like relationship that he created us for. He created everything and then gave man authority over it, put him there so that he could have this perfect relationship with God. One was based on friendship. Amen? That's what he's trying to do. That's what he's trying to establish. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, and we'll read beginning at verse 1. I'm going to read all the way down through 17, Sheila. So it's 1 Timothy 1. Verses 1 through 17, I'll read fast. Praise the Lord. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that, were, that they teach no other doctrine. This is Paul. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith. So do. This is what Tim mentioned too. You hear all the time about prophets. This guy's a prophet. That guy's a prophet. This woman's a prophet. Somebody's a prophet. There's, there's a good way to find out if they're legit. If they're not edifying, if they're not building up, if they're not encouraging, then they are not a prophet. I don't care how many mysteries they may tell you about. They're not operating in the office of a prophet if they are not encouraging, edifying, and lifting up. If they're pointing out negatives and, and discerning evil about you, do you need to know that? This is like calling the hotline for psychic, you know, Kate or somebody. And she's, I'm going to spend... 50 bucks an hour or something, I don't know what they charge, but it's astronomical, I'm sure, for her to tell me what I already know? I mean, really, that's what they do. How does she know? Who cares? You already knew it. You need 50 bucks to find out somebody else knows what you already know. Give me, tell me something I don't know. <laughs> Amen. Now the end of the commandment is charity, which is love, out of a pure heart and of good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some have swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law. See, this is people that have gone back to religion, people that have been saved by grace. Paul's telling this young man, this Timothy, this young pastor, this is what you're going to have to deal with. Amen? Speak good, speak positive, speak 
well. Speak wholeness. You say, well, you know, that's the problem. Everybody's got itchy ears. They just want to hear something good. Well, that's what Jesus preached. Good news. If you want bad news, you can dig around in the Old Testament and find it. Amen. But God waited on them to come to him. He waited to judge for them to come. So he wouldn't have to judge. Amen? Desiring to be teachers of the law. Understanding neither what they say nor where they affirm. So they're teaching something they don't even know. They don't even understand the purpose for the law, and yet they're trying to teach it as though you should be keeping it. And give you no way to do it. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. So the law is good if it brings somebody to Jesus. The thou shall nots are to get you to the thou who has. To Jesus who has fulfilled the law, right? Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. How many know you're the righteousness of God in Christ if you're born again? You're the righteous. The law is not for us. The law is for the unsaved. To bring them to Christ. Amen? I can't do this. My life's getting out of control here. I mean, that's why I cried out to the Lord. I mean, I was doing dope. I was drinking. Uh, I was about to end another marriage. Yeah, in Houston, Texas, I was just done. I was finished. Sally packed up, took Allison back to her mother's. That's what women do. They go back to mom. Praise the Lord. But anyway, I knew the, you know, the routine. I'd already been down that road several times. But I'd been off on a two or three day drunk after she'd left and come back. I, most of you all heard the story. It's just, just for the sake of hearing it again. Come back to that house where we lived in Houston. And I just got down on the floor and I just, well, cussing, I was carrying on, I was ranting, I was raving, I was blaming God, I was blaming everybody. And I just said, hey, if you can do anything about this, you better do something about it. Because I'm not going through any more of it. I'm through. I'm done. I can't live like this anymore. I don't want any more families torn apart. I don't want to be any more messed up. I don't want to live like this. And I didn't have a vision. I didn't see a bright light. But God began to direct my steps to a place where we would come to know the Lord, not as I know him today, but just as a Savior at least. And he's been revealing himself more and more to me all of my life ever since. Especially in those first years when I, we tried everything. You know, the dressing a certain way and keeping all the laws and the rituals and to the extent that we could only to feel failures, you know, feel like a hypocrite. God is good. He kept loving, kept revealing, kept showing us. We're the apple of his eye. He delights in us. He loves us. That's a great, that's, a, that's such a liberating thing because it's not based on me. I can be a slug one day and just, you know, totally kind of out of the whole thing. God's love doesn't change for me. It doesn't, it doesn't alter. He loves us. His grace is continuously being poured out. Amen? Knowing this, the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly, for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers. Now look at the laws for, for this. Why? To get these whoremongers, these manslayers, these murderers of mothers and fathers, these profane, to get them to come to God. Amen. To turn to God. To get the Jeffrey Dahmers is having a late night snack who happens to be the person he just murdered and God's reaching out for him. It's, it, it's impossible for a natural mind to conceive this. But this is the love of God. This is the extreme grace of God. Praise the Lord. For whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for man, men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. So any other crazy behavior, any other nasty stuff, that included, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. 
who was before a blasphemer. Paul's talking about himself. I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. He didn't believe in a God of love. He believed in a God of strict rules and regulations that you've got to follow. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit, for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So Paul said, my life as a blasphemer, as a murderer, is a pattern so that people that come later can look at this person that I was and say that God's grace was there for me. It was God's mercy. It was God's love. I was destroying the very thing that God was creating on this earth to bring His reality here. And God didn't come in and snuff me out. God came and gave me grace. So that my life then would be a pattern for others to see what God is willing to do in anybody's life. In all of these things that we've already read, all of these despicable kind of definitions of humanity. Now, under the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So grace is love that seeks you out when you have nothing to give in return. Grace is love that's coming at you that has nothing to do with you. Grace is irrational in that it doesn't have any weights or measures. It doesn't, it, it, it doesn't make sense to the natural man because it doesn't have any way of measuring who should get it and who shouldn't. Everybody gets it. It's available for everybody. Grace defies logic. I'm talking about extreme grace, real grace, the grace that Paul's talking about, the grace that the, the, the Bible teaches. It defies logic. It's a liberating contradiction. It's a contradiction between what we deserve and what we get. We know we deserve punishment, but we don't get punishment. We get the love of God. We know we deserve to be cast off, but we don't get cast off. He'll never leave us or forsake us. It doesn't make sense. It's not rational. And if we make it rational, if we dumb it down to where our natural minds can understand it, we have just destroyed what God intended. This thing is so beyond human understanding. We all operate in some kind of reciprocal relationships. We expect something in return. God doesn't. He's only expecting that you receive it. Not for Him, for you. He's already paid the price. He doesn't have to do anything else. It's, it's one-way love. Period. Genesis chapter 15, uh, verse 12. See, I, wanna, I want us to believe this the way Paul preached it, the way Jesus preached it. Paul preached it so radically, so outside the box that people heard him preaching and said, are you telling us we should sin some more? We should sin more than we have been so that we'll get more grace? He said, no. I'm just saying when you sin, there is grace. Why? Because Paul knew they were going to sin anyway. He knew they would fail. They're humans. He wasn't trying to give them a license to sin as the old cliche goes, they were already sinning without a license. They were already doing it. He's trying to give them hope. Trying to show them what God has really done for them. Anything less than this. I'm telling you, we may think we're doing God a big favor, but the truth is we diminish God every time we diminish grace. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. Verse 17.
And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on him, a horror of great darkness. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. Now, Abraham said, God, how, how am I going to know that you're going to do what you said you were going to do for me? Now, mo remember, Abraham didn't have any law. There wasn't any law. God declared him to be righteous simply because he believed God. So Ab God has given him this promise that through you, I'm going to bless the entire world. Every place you set your foot is going to be yours. It will belong to you. Amen? And you'll be wealthy. You're going to be blessed in every area, every way, right? So Abraham said, and he, and he told him, you're going to have a son. Obviously, if you're going to be the progenitor of an entire race of people through whom the Messiah will eventually come, you've got to have a kid, right? So he's promised him this child. And Abraham's overwhelmed by the promises, but he said, how am I going to know that you're really going to do this? And God said something that Abraham would understand because under, under those times, in those times, they had blood covenants. Clans would come together and they would sacrifice an animal or they would cut themselves. And we've seen the old Indian things where they blood brothers. That was a type of a blood covenant. The only kind of covenant that had any lasting value was a blood covenant. So they, they would kill an animal or several animals, and basically what they're saying is, let this same thing happen to me if I break this covenant. What we've done to these animals, I'll deserve if I ever break this covenant. So God shows up and tells Abraham, I'm going to make a covenant with you. Abraham, like a lot of good Christians, falls asleep. And when he, it says then shortly after, he falls asleep, then here comes this lamp. This, the sun went down, there was dark, uh, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp, pass between the pieces. They split the carcasses in half, showing the two of them. So then they would walk through the middle of these, and that would be the de declaration of their covenant with one another. Only Abraham wasn't walking through it. He was sleeping. It was only God who was walking down through these, through these animals. Abraham isn't walking between the animals. He's just sleeping. God's commitment to Abraham, and therefore because we're the children of Abraham, children of faith. His commitment to us to be our Savior, to be our Lord, to be our Father, to be our friend, is a one-sided gift. It is not based on what we do. We don't even enter into the contract. It's God with himself. So that we cannot break it. God's commitment to Abraham is the same commitment that he has to us. The stuff grace is made of is God. God loves Abraham because of God. God loves you because of God. Not because of you, not because of Abraham, but because of God. Just like Abraham slept through the covenant ceremony, where were we at the crucifixion? We weren't there. We were asleep in our mother's womb, or we were asleep in our great, 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 how many greats you can go back. We didn't exist. We weren't there. But God still made the covenant, even though we weren't connected. Amen? The grace that was launched in Genesis 15 touches down on Calvary. And it's been released, it continues to be released every single day, every minute of every day, to anybody who will receive it. Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection makes possible God's pleasure to flow freely to unpleasant people who will put their faith in Him. Grace is more than a pass. Grace is the most dangerous, expectation-wrecking, smile-creating, counterintuitive reality that there is. Something only God can provide. Something that only God would have thought of. Jesus didn't give his life for comrades. Jesus didn't give his life for friends. He didn't give his life for buddies. He didn't give his life for a loved one. He didn't give his life to anybody who had earned his trust. He didn't give his life for anybody who would have deserved his life being given. Jesus died for his enemies. 
Think about that for a minute. He died for his enemies. The psychotic cannibal who had sex with dead people and ate their body parts. It's hard to take, isn't it? But that's exactly what he did. Grace is God's stubborn love for his enemies to bring us to paradise, to the place he created us for, and to bring glory to him. Let me just close with this. You say, well, I, I don't know. I, I just can't get this. I, I, I can't fathom this. You ought to because it just makes God so good. We say he's a good God. He, he's more than a good God. I don't even know what word we could use, what superlative we'd come up with to say, to describe the goodness of God. Because while I may not think that Jeffrey Dahmer deserves anything but hell, God doesn't want to see him in hell. God wants to deliver his enemies and make them friends. Okay, speaking of history, how many of you remember when this lunatic uh, nutcase went into that Amish school and killed all those little kids? The parents of those girls that were murdered prayed for and forgave the murderer. They had a prayer meeting specifically for praying for the guy who killed their kids, that he would receive forgiveness. They, they had their forgiveness. He had their forgiveness. They were praying for God's forgiveness for him. They went to the same parents, went to this man's wife and family, and forgave her and the family so they wouldn't feel any guilt or any shame or any condemnation for what her husband and the father of her children had done. And then, these same parents, whose children had been murdered, had a fundraiser and raised money for the family of the man who murdered their children so they could bury him and so that they could support their own life. That is grace. grace. That's a revelation of God in Christ. And that's what God wants to see from the church. I'm not saying we need to go out and run down to the jail and start loving murderers. But if it's asked, I suspect you should. But in the meantime, everybody else that we come into contact, I don't care what their life is, I don't care what their life has been, I don't care what it looks like it's going to be. God wants them to know that he loves them beyond their wildest imagination. And that forgiveness is just as close as their acceptance. If you'll confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. He doesn't say if you never committed certain crimes. He's not interested in the crime. The crime's already been dealt with. The sin has already been dealt with. And as despicable as it may seem to us as individuals, Jeffrey Dahmer was important enough to God that he would have died if he was the only human being on this planet. I, I, I don't have an explanation for it. I'm just saying that's the reality. This is the love of God that we think we understand because we personalize it. Amen? You know, and, and after a certain amount of time, even though we talk about the bad life that we had, it's become not real. You know? It's an old saying that all prostitutes become saints if they live long enough. <laughs> That's true. That's true of all of us. 
if we live, if we outlive all of our contemporaries, we can be the saint <laughs> because there's nobody there to say otherwise. But the truth is God has made it possible for every prostitute, for every murderer, for every sinner, for every failure to become a success and to be saved and to be whole and to spend eternity. I promise you, in heaven, if Jeffrey Dahmer was saved, I don't, again, I'm just taking this man's word for it, but if Jeffrey Dahmer was saved, and there's no reason why he couldn't have been saved if he would have accepted Christ, there's not going to be any sign on him like the big A, you know, for adulterer or something like they used to do back in the days of the pilgrims. In heaven, he's not going to be any different than anybody else. He's not going to get a little shack and everybody else has got mansions. You know what I'm saying? If we're using architecture here as a metaphor, he's going to have everything everybody else has got. Because as far as God's concerned, he is the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm telling you, this is huge. This is big. And we don't think about it because it's awkward to think about. But the more you think about it, the more you can appreciate God's love for you. How much he cares. What he's willing, that's why he, by his stripes, were healed. He suffered all of that stuff for every one of us. Not with the expectation that at some point between, I, I, I believe, Jesus, that you died for my sins, and heaven... I'm going to be perfect. I was perfect the moment I said that. The moment I believed that, mm -hmm. as far as God's concerned, I've been perfect ever since. Amen. Now, do I want my life to be a, a positive reflection of that? Sure I do. But I'm old enough and smart enough to know now that that isn't always going to be the case. There's going to be times that I was, I mean, just on the way to church this morning. I gave a blessing to like two or three people that were driving <laughs> not as fast as I wanted them to drive. And they got hung up in a yellow light. I'm thinking, yellow light's caution, man. That don't mean stop. Just look both ways and hurry up. Speed up and look both directions. That's caution. Praise the Lord. So I'm just saying, God, for God so loved each of us and all of us that he gave and he continues to give. We ought to be the happy. That's what I'm saying. We ought to be the happiest. We ought, to, we ought to be the most positive people. I mean, if God is for you, who can be against you? And if God is for you to this degree, who cares who's against you? Exactly. Right? Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. God bless all of you for being here. Thank you for your patience. And uh, have a blessed week. Hopefully we'll see you back here Wednesday or, or Sunday. Enjoy the goodness of God. Hallelujah. You deserve it. Jesus paid for it. Hallelujah.